the Facebook video of Joshua last night. It was a riot, wasn't it? <laughs> Uh -huh. I think everybody wants. Anyhow, would you bow with me in prayer, Father? Father God, thank you again for these, your people. Thank you for another opportunity to gather together as your family, as your people, as a body of believers here in Linden, North Carolina. Father, we thank you that you've placed us here together. We thank you for the opportunities that you have given us, the opportunities that you will give us in the future to glorify your name. We ask that you would take us and give us a burden for the lost, give us a burden for this community, and give us a burden for one another. And we ask all of these things in the precious name. Amen. The Apostle Paul changed the world like very few men ever have. Maybe like no other man other than Jesus ever has. He has affected the history of the world. And he did it without the modern communication devices we have. He didn't have email. He didn't have a telephone. He didn't have an automobile. He didn't have planes. He didn't have train. He didn't have Zoom. He had no way to communicate with the church at large. He spent many years of his 20, he was in ministry 25 to 30 years. He spent many of those years in prison. Couldn't even walk anywhere. Yet with all of those limitations, he changed the world. I mean, some of, some of us in here are more ancient than the rest of us. We, know, we knew a time where you actually had to walk or ride your bicycle to your friend's house to see if they were home or not. You could go all this way, just hope they were home. Because we had a party line. And the gossips down the street wouldn't get off the phone so some other house could get in on the phone. Y'all know what a party line is? It means the whole street shared one phone line. So you had to pick it up and see if somebody was using it before you could use it. That's how old some of you are yeah. <laughs> we actually had a phone number we could call and ask them what time it was. Yeah, we did. We did. <laughs> Paul didn't even have that. Paul either walked, he rode a boat, rode a donkey. None of those are, are ways to get somewhere quick. Yet he changed the world. Sometimes I ask myself, and maybe you've asked yourself this question too. Will I even change Linden, North Carolina by serving God here? I, I don't know. The scary thing, the sad thing is I can't answer that. I don't know if I will have a lasting impact on Linden, North Carolina. Maybe I will know one day. But I pray, it is my earnest prayer that not only I, but Unity Baptist Church will change Linden, North Carolina for the glory of God because we serve Christ here. Now, obviously, I don't have the gifts and the talents that the Apostle Paul had. Very few have ever possessed those gifts and talents that God gave Paul. However, that does not mean that I don't have my own gifts and talents from God. I need to use them as diligently as the Apostle Paul used his. Now, we, we should not compare our results with the results of the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul was given a ministry for a certain reason. He was given those gifts for a certain reason, and that was to bring the gospel of the good news of Christ to the Gentile world, and he did. But we can look at some principles. We can look at some of the principles that Paul regulated his ministry with or focused his ministry on and apply those same principles to our work here in Linden. And I think if we would do that, then not only would we change Linden, North Carolina, we will accomplish the mission that God has given Unity Baptist Church and each individual believer. So to do that, we're gonna look at a slice of Paul's life. It's just a slice of Paul's life. It's in Acts chapter 20, verses one through 16. And we're gonna see what Paul was ultimately committed to, to bring the gospel to the nations, what Paul was committed to, to, in order to make sure that he fulfilled the ministry, the mission that God had given him. So read with me, if you would, 
Acts chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. After the uproar ceased, you remember the uproar? Last week, we talked about the uproar that happened and all that stuff. After the uproar ceased, Paul sent for the disciples, and after encouraging them, he said farewell and departed from Macedonia. When he had gone through those regions and had given them much encouragement, he came to Greece. There he spent three months, and when a plot was made against him by the Jews as he was about to set sail for Syria, he decided to return through Macedonia. So Peter the Berean, the son of Phyrus, accompanied him, and of the Thessalonians, Aristarchus and Secundus, and Gaius of Derbe, and Timothy, and the Asians, Tychicus and Trophimus. These went on ahead and were waiting for us at Troas. But we sailed away from Philippi after the days of unleavened bread. And in five days we came to them at Troas, where we stayed for seven days. On the first day of the week, when we had gathered together to break bread, Paul talked with them, intending to depart on the next day. And he prolonged his speech until midnight. There were many lamps in the upper room where we were gathered. And a young man named Eutychus, sitting at the window, sank into a deep sleep as Paul still talked, or talked still longer. And being overcome by sleep, he fell down from the third story and was taken up dead. But Paul went down and bent over him, and taking him in his arms, said, Do not be alarmed, for his life is in him. And when Paul had gone up and had broken bread and eaten, he conversed with them a long time, a long while until daybreak, and so departed. And they took the youth away alive, but were not, and were not a little comforted. But going ahead to the ship, we set sail for Azos, intending to take Paul aboard there, for so he had arranged, intending himself to go by land. And when he had met us at Azos, we took him on board and went to Mytilene. And sailing from there, we came the following day opposite Chios. The next day we touched at Samos, and the day after that we went to Mytilus, for Paul had decided to sail past Ephesus so that he might not have to spend time in Asia, for he was hastening to be at Jerusalem, if possible, on the day of Pentecost. All right, before we get into this, you'll notice that Paul preaches a long sermon, four hours, about four hours Paul preaches. Thankfully, we don't preach four hours today. Somebody has said, I, I don't know if you've heard this, I've heard it a few times. If you're gonna preach four hours, you better be able to raise the dead, because that's the credibility that you need if you're gonna preach for four hours. Well, I don't have that gift in this either, so. Thankfully, we're not gonna preach four hours, but we are gonna look at the first thing I want you to understand is the commitment Paul had to establish and strengthen the churches. Notice that he's gonna go back to Jerusalem. We're gonna get into why he's going back to Jerusalem in just a minute. But we're gonna look at this first century church service and see what Paul's focus was. Because oftentimes we look at Paul as an evangelist and he was a great evangelist. He went to those who unbelieved to share the gospel. That was not his primary focus. His primary focus was on establishing and strengthening local churches so that those local churches would continue to share the gospel in their communities. That was his focus. So it says he stayed there and encouraged the believers. Then he goes here and encourages the believers. I wish sometimes Luke had, had recorded how he encouraged them. What, what were the words he used to encourage them with? We probably have a synopsis of it from Paul's letters, but I would like to have more detail. Luke is one of, uh, at, Luke is one of human history's most finest historians. That's a fact. That's not, even non-biblical scholars will tell you that. Luke was a master historian. Sometimes he's so frustratingly scant on details. He throws some words out there that tells us Paul was up where Yugoslavia is today and Albania is today, preaching the gospel, establishing churches, strengthening those churches. I want to know those stories. We have very little detail on what Paul does on a day-to-day -day basis. Even here in this story, we have very little detail. But beginning in verse 7, we have a few. We see that Paul gathers together with the church on the first day of the week, Sunday. This is the earliest 
reverence to the church, swapping from a Jewish Sabbath, Saturday, to the Lord's Day, Sunday. It's one of the great proofs of the resurrection. Why would, they, why would these Jews who were so steeped in, in their cultural background, so steeped in hundreds of years of focus on the Sabbath, Sabbath, if you didn't know, a Saturday. Sabbath is a Saturday. This is not the Christian Sabbath. This is the Lord's Day. The church, the early Jewish church stopped meeting on the Sabbath. I cannot imagine how difficult that was for some of them. But the fact that they stopped meeting on the Sabbath to meet on the first day of the week shows us Jesus did in fact raise from the dead on the first day of the week. Nothing else is going to cause them to change. Nothing else is going to cause them to turn their back on their cultural heritage and history. Does that mean that we're to observe a Christian Sabbath or are we to do the things that they did for the Jewish Sabbath? No. Jesus in Hebrews chapter 4 tells us Jesus is our Sabbath rest. Nowhere, all, all 10 of the 10 commandments except for one is repeated for us in the New Testament. You know what that one is? It's the one about the Sabbath. It's not repeated for us in the New Testament. Paul warns about a whole lot of host of issues. He never once warns us to obey the Sabbath. When the Jewish Jerusalem Council gave instructions to the Gentile church, did they say, abstain from blood, stop worshiping idols, and obey the Sabbath? No. They didn't. did not mention the Sabbath. Because Jesus Christ fulfilled what the Sabbath stood for. The Sabbath was a day of rest. The gospel of Jesus Christ teaches us that we rest in him. I don't strive to earn my place with God. I put my faith in the rest that Christ provides. That's what it means to observe the fat Sabbath. That's what it means to keep the Sabbath holy. To keep that place, the work of Christ, utmost in my life. We started a new series in Sunday school this morning. Gospel above all. The good news above all. The good news is simply this. It's person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ. That encapsulates the gospel. Who was he and what did he do? And it's good news because he provides rest for my struggles, for my, for my efforts to get to God that will never suffice. So they met on the Sabbath. They met on the first day of the week. It wasn't a weekend in the Roman world. So most of them worked during the day. So the early church met in the evenings. Nothing says we have to meet at 11 o'clock on Sunday. Tradition says that. I know Cheryl would be very happy if we put it off to 3 p.m. so she can sleep to them. She, she gets up earlier on Sunday than she does any other day of the week. And sometimes we might have to do that. Maybe next time it snows, we might explore, wait until afternoon, burns it off. Nothing says we have to meet in the morning other than we're used to it. But Paul preaches to the church. He wanted to encourage the church through the preaching of the word. And it was a long sermon. Now, I doubt Paul's sermons were typically four hours long. It's the one time the church of Troas was going to ever have to hear the Apostle Paul in person. And so he poured himself out for them. He preached so long that a young man, the, the, the Greek word means a young man, Anywhere from early teens to early 20s. And Luke, one of the reasons he's such a fine historian is the details that he gives. He mentions the fact that there were many lamps lit in the room. You know what that happens? What happens when you have a whole lot of fire going on in the room? It burns up some of the oxygen. So that can make somebody drowsy. So this young man, like young men are wont to do, thought it was a great idea to set a Third story, when the seal. Man, we've all been there. And we think we're invincible. He's sitting in the third story, uh, when the seal, and gets a little sleepy. Right then, he should have got out of the wind to seal. But he doesn't. He's a young man. We talked last night. Young men's front lobes are not completely full until they're 26. <laughs> so they still make some dangerous decisions. 
He falls down and he dies. Paul goes down there and does what Elijah and Elisha did. Embraces the young man and God imparts that life back to him. God gives him back his life through the Apostle Paul's touch. But I think it's very, very interesting how Luke downplays this marvelous miracle and sandwiches it, sandwiches it between Paul's preaching, which is the word he uses, talking about Paul preaching, and Paul's speaking. He uses a different word. Paul preaches till midnight, and then he spends the rest of the night having a conversation with them over a meal. It implies, that Greek word implies question and answers. And Paul just wasn't standing up there pontificating on the scriptures. Paul is, is something... If you've never joined us on Wednesday night, shame on you, number one, you're doing nothing else. It's dark out there by that time. But if you want to join us on Wednesday night, it's much less structured than this. Because I'm, I'll be honest with you, I'm much, much, my favorite part of teaching, my favorite part of Wednesday night is when questions come. Because I learn as much during the questions as I do studying for the lesson. Because we're all different. We all have a different perspective. I'm not saying I will always have the answer to the question, but at least that question will make me go back and research. At least that question will cause me to, to learn. That's part of my preparation for Wednesday nights. What questions can I anticipate? And let me see if I can find some answers for them. Now, I don't usually anticipate some, because the one that's asking questions is smarter than the one that's answering. But that's what Paul is doing. Paul is pouring his life out into the church at Troas. I don't think Paul's ever been there. I don't think Paul knew these people from Adam, other than the fact they were God's church. And he was committed to strengthening the church so that the church would serve God where he had placed it. Brothers and sisters, God has placed us here for a reason. But I think the fact that, that Luke downplays, if you will, seems to downplay this st stupendous miracle is the fact that he wants to get across that the church is going to be sustained, the church is going to grow, not by miracles, but by the word of God. The church needs to eat well. J. Vernon McGee used to famously say, sermonettes produce Christianettes. Because there's a trend in today's day and age, it began some time ago, that we're to make the church user friendly. That means we're to start entertaining people, shorten the sermons. Some out there teach maybe 15 minutes, it stops, but you need to speak. Because attention span, you know, people keep keep hold their attention as long as they used to because they've got TV, they've got games, they've got the, the phones and all that stuff. J. Burton, he said, sermon has to make Christian eggs. In other words, the primary responsibility of a shepherd is to flee his, feed his flock. The primary responsibility from whoever, Clyde, me, Christian, Terry, whoever is up here, our primary responsibility is to show you and share with you and preach to you and teach to you the word of God. That was Paul's focus. And I think Luke is saying, yeah, God Paul just healed somebody who's dead. And then we're gone. Then we're going to talk about Paul's interaction with him upstairs over a meal. The church met on a Sunday. They met to study and learn and hear the word of God preached. They met to worship. Luke encapsulates that by saying they met for the Lord's Supper, to break bread together. Seems to be that the early church every Sunday would, would, would practice communion. But here's the thing. What does communion point to? Communion points us to the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Communion should be a worshipful time for the church. Elsewhere we're told, Paul tells them, hey, sing to one another. Spiritual songs and hymns. Speak to one another in songs and hymns. The early church came together and worshiped. They worshiped God and they studied his word. 
That's what an early church service was like. They came together to celebrate who Christ was and study him. Paul was committed to strengthening the churches. He was committed to train godly men for leadership roles. Luke lists a group of men who go with Paul. He lists a group of men who go with Paul, many of them Gentiles. What is Paul doing? Why is he taking these men? Well, primarily, the reason these men are going is something we'll get into in just a minute. They're carrying the offering that Paul had encouraged the churches to raise for the poor church at Jerusalem. They were their church's representative, one of the leaders of their local church, to carry this offering to Jerusalem, to give it over to the Jewish believers. But Paul spends his time. We just went through 2 Timothy in Sunday school. What is 2 Timothy ultimately about? 2 Timothy is ultimately about Paul reminding Timothy and getting some last teaching into Timothy to train Timothy. He says, Timothy, be ready to preach in season, out of season, at all times. He reminds Timothy of who he is in Christ. He reminds Timothy of the calling that he has received. He reminds Timothy that he has been trained by Paul to continue on the mission. We should all pray that God will bring along somebody in your life who is older in, in Christ than you are, more mature in Christ than you are, to help you continue to grow, to help strengthen you. I have somebody like that. Somebody to mentor me, to come alongside of me, to help me to continue to, in my journey to grow. We should also pray that God will bring somebody alongside of you who is younger in the faith, who is less mature in the faith, so that you can impart what God has taught you to them, to help them grow, with the ultimate purpose of maturing them to share the gospel. I'm excited about our Sunday morning thing because ultimately what it's gonna tell us, I believe, is nothing is more important than our sharing the gospel, nothing. J.D. Greer talked in the video this morning. There's more happiness in heaven, there's more joy in heaven, there's more celebration in heaven, over one lost sinner that finds Christ than there is for 99 of his saved sheep having a good time at church. Yes, God loves to see us come together. But Paul does not spend his time, if you read his writings, if you read what Paul is doing, if you read about his journey, if you study the Apostle Paul's theology and doctrine, you see Paul is not creating a church to be in a holy hut, a comfortable little place where they come together, hunker down from the outside world. I mean, look at the Apostle Paul's life. He's been beaten. He's been thrown in jail. He's been stoned. He continues to do it. And he expects the local church to go through the very same things. He doesn't say, win some to Christ and bring them in here and hide from the world because the world's going to hate you. No, he says, go out there into the world, win them for Christ, and then stay out in the world. Yes, you're going to get hurt. Yes, you're going to get persecuted. Yes, some of you are going to die. It's worth it. The gospel above all. Share the gospel with the Lord. He doesn't train these men. He doesn't encourage the churches or establish the churches to create a, a country club. He does it. He establishes the churches and his mission, his vision for the churches that they would be training institutes to prepare the body for the works of ministry. Isn't that what he says? pastor's job, the elder's job is to train the body for the works of ministry. Too many churches think, you know, there's the leadership team. That's the outreach team. That's what they're for. No, we're all to do it. Do you ever want to know if you're going to make a difference for Christ where he's placed you? Unless you commit yourself to a local assembly, you won't. 
doesn't happen by accident. God's prescribed method for getting the gospel out there is to create a local body of believers. That's his decree. How's the gospel going to spread? I'm going to create a local body of believers. That's one of Paul's reoccurring themes, isn't it? We're a body. I don't have the gifts that you have. I don't. Never will. So if I'm trying to do your job, we're doing an incomplete job. We're not going to make the difference that we should have. And vice versa. I have gifts that you don't. And if I'm not using my gifts, then we're not going to be effective. That's what Paul means. It's the unity of a body of believers. Look, John chapter 17. I, I will harp on this until y'all forget who I was. John chapter 17, verse 20, 21. Jesus prays for the apostles. They're in the upper room. And he also prays, and this is what he said, he prays for those who would believe on me through their, through their word. In other words, through the teaching of the apostles. Brothers and sisters, that's you and me. Jesus is praying openly for you and me. He prays for one thing. That they be one. The unity of the body of Christ. And he says what? So that the world will know you sent me, Father. How's the world going to know that God the Father sent Jesus? Jesus himself tells us. It's when we come, become an actual body of believers. In this place down the street, that body of believers. Further down the street, that body of believers. Wherever the body of believers meet, that's a local body of believers. We should be one with all of them. That's what Paul is doing by going to Jerusalem with these men. That's what Paul is doing, I believe, primarily in having the Gentile churches take up a collection for the Jews, for the Jewish Christians. Because Paul understood something instinctively. That that wall, that cultural wall of separation between Jew and Gentile must go in the church. It cannot exist in the church. So he wants those Jewish believers who grew up in Judaism, who all their lives were told and believed with all of their heart that the Gentiles were inferior. They were barbarian. They were beneath contempt. Paul wants them to understand, no, Christ changed them too. We're all one in Christ. So he brings these Gentile believers with a generous gift to the poor Christians in Jerusalem so that the necessity, the vital necessity of unity in Christ would come forward. He needed, he wanted, he was desperate for that wall of separation between Jews and Gentiles to be broken. That's how God envisions his church. Doesn't matter what your cultural background is, your age, your color, doesn't matter. If you name the name of Christ, you're my brother, you're my sister, and I love you. That's what Paul is. He is committed to establishing churches committed to strengthening churches, committed to teaching leaders, and committed to the unity of the body of believers. And finally, he's committed to strengthen the church for mission. Years ago, not, not that long ago, wasn't that long ago, the, the big saying out of the Southern Baptist Commission was, be on mission, live on mission. We're on mission. Paul exemplified what it meant to be on mission. Everything Paul did was for the purpose of establishing and strengthening local body of believers. Paul's evangelism, when he would go to the unbelievers and share the gospel, that was with the intent to create a local body of believers. That's why he did that. Yes, we should individually share the gospel. But Paul was called, Paul was, was commissioned to go out and win souls for Christ. Many of these men who accompanied him came to know Christ through Paul's preaching. But you notice, Paul doesn't lead somebody to Christ and say, well, good luck. Go find a church somewhere. 
Mm. No, Paul is in for the whole ride. If he leads somebody to Christ, he's there. He's bringing them with him. He's writing letters to them. He's keeping in contact with them, continuing to support them and encourage them and grow them and teach them. That's the only reason the church has continued past the first century. It's men like Paul, men like John. John, we don't talk about as much, but John maybe was, was as, as important, if not more important than Paul in perpetuating the growth of Christianity. Much of what we have in the early church fathers, the writings of the early church fathers, and it's a lot, come directly from John's disciple, Polycarp, and the men that Polycarp continued to teach after John left. That's how we know what the early church believed. It's pretty much what we believe. We'll go back and read. It's one of the reasons I'm Southern Baptist. I didn't grow up Southern Baptist. But when I really got to, to read what the apostles taught and what the apostles believed and how the apostles operated and how Paul established the churches, I didn't have any other place to go if I wanted to get back to that. But brothers and sisters, Paul lived on mission and he expects the church to live on mission as well. I'm sure that's what we're going to hear a lot in Sunday school the next eight weeks, the next seven weeks. It's the, it's the gospel above all. And what is the gospel? It's the good news that Jesus is the Son of God, chosen Messiah, who came, lived my life that I couldn't live, took my place on the cross that I was supposed to be on, and put his perfect, holy, sinless body between the wrath of Almighty God and this miserable sinner, so that then he could turn around and give his righteousness to me so that I can stand blameless in front of God. That's what he did. Brothers and sisters, that must be the focus of the Union Baptist Church. Yes, we like to come together and meet. Yes, that's part of church. We're to enjoy one another's coming. We're to be a family. But ultimately, what we do, the only thing that we do that will make a difference to this world, that will change this world for the glory of God, is to get outside of the door and share the gospel with the lost. To spend our time strengthening this church and the other churches. Be on mission. Doesn't mean you need to be a missionary. Some of y'all's mission is on Fort Bragg. Some of them is here in the community. Some of them is wherever you're at. Some of them is at your job. Some of them is in your family. you got to be on mission all the time. Because at the end of the end of my life, I don't want to look back and say, you know what? I didn't really make a difference with Christ. I want to look back on my life. I want to cross into heaven and hear, well done, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master. Nothing else could even compare to hearing those words. No accolades, no success, no amount of riches, nothing on this planet will ever even come within a whisper of matching when Jesus will say, well done, my good and faithful servant. That will make everything worth it. Everything. Heavenly Father, thank you again for these, your people. Thank you for the words of the Apostle Paul. Thank you for showing us, Father, what those precious first century believers were like and how they worshiped, how they came together, Father, and how they continued to work to change the world for your glory and for your purpose. We ask that you would allow us as Unity Baptist Church not to magnify our own names, Father, but simply to go out in humbleness 
and in gentleness and in love share the good news of our precious Lord. It's in his name we pray. Amen. And as we sing.